Hey, what's going on, guys? Welcome back to the Jimmy Scott Fitness Podcast Radio Show. Coming to you on this Sunday, May the 14th, 2023. Hopefully it finds you staying safe and staying sweaty all at the same time. On today's episode, we are talking about why most fail online. Most businesses, definitely most fitness businesses, uh, entrepreneurs in the, uh, the health and fitness space, uh, my experience with it over uh, a decade now, plus being uh, online, and uh, playing off a, a note I got from uh, my man Pat Rigsby, who I've done a ton of stuff with Pat online over the years. Uh, ran the first uh, mastermind group I was in that really focused on uh, just kind of being an online entrepreneur, if you will. And I'm going to kind of share best practices in there with you guys, the things I see that have worked, uh, have not worked, and uh, everything in between. But before I jump into that real quick, uh, just some housekeeping things. One, our Summer Advanced Metcon Challenge is kicking off here on 522. So you guys have about seven-ish days to register for that. JeremyScottFitness.app slash Summer Challenge is the link. It's also in the show notes below here. No matter where you're listening, you can scroll down, click it, and you guys can join us if you're within a relative time frame of May 14th, 2023. Uh, we're doing a grand prize. Flying the winner to uh, Scottsdale, Arizona here. Uh, put you up in an awesome resort for a couple of nights. We are doing weekly prizes as well. The grand prize winner can come in here in the gym, rip it with us and our community, uh, kind of meet everybody, have a great time. We uh, Obviously, this program gives you the Sunday Advanced Metcons every other day and a very deep, detailed mobility flows as well. Some of those are 12 minutes. Some of them are 25 minutes. They're, uh, you know, from more or less follow along. So if you want to follow along exactly with me or pause it and spend the time on your tight and trouble spots, you have the option to do that in there as well. So it's free for app members. Everybody else, you guys get a week for free. And then you can stay on for just a couple of pennies, you know, probably win a bunch of awesome stuff, get fit, get mobile. It's a win-win across the board. And if you don't know what you're doing for the summer, this is a great option for you guys to uh, to kind of get in the game, get fit, and have something laid out for you for at least the next five-plus weeks. So jeremyscottfitness.app slash summer challenge, links below, join us. It'll be fun. Again, costs you damn near nothing, and uh, you can win a bunch of stuff and get fit along the way. Already you guys know this episode is brought to you by my homies at Athletic Greens, the one thing I take every single day and I never miss. Athleticgreens.com slash Jeremy Scott gets you guys a year's supply of vitamin D and five free travel packs with order one. So you should already be taking D3 with the K2, which is how we pair it together, and we'll give you five travel packs just for ordering. It's the best tasting greens on the planet, in my opinion, and it's easy to travel with. It's my one go-to on the road that I never, ever, ever don't take. I was just in Palm Springs for work for a couple of days uh, doing a talk and uh, took my greens with me. I take the packs, I throw it in some water, shake it, slam it, and I'm good to go. If you don't eat enough vegetables, this is an easy fix for you guys. It has probiotics in there, digestive enzymes as well. I believe it'll give you guys more energy over time. I think it'll help with your immune system as well. And if you want to try a sample 100% for free, message us, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, wherever you want to hit us up, send us your mailing address, all your info, just request a sample, and Monica will send you the packs right to your front door. You can try them 100% for free, see if you like them. Again, I do think it's the best tasting greens that are out there. And then you get hooked up with all the free stuff from there. But if you want a free sample, no charge to you, just ask and we will give it to you. Don't feel weird. That's why we're offering. Nobody else offers this. We are happy to. So reach out. You'll get the free stuff. Otherwise, if you're just like, hey, you know, I need that in my life. I don't eat enough greens and I could use a little energy boost and I want to be healthier. Athleticgreens.com slash Jeremy Scott will get you a bunch of free stuff right now. Also brought to you by my friends at JLab Pro. Jeremy Scott Fitness at JLabPro.com. This is where we get our protein, collagen, turmeric, and our krill oils. We always have a discount on the protein and the collagen as well for the first time buyers. And then I think right now the krill oil is like half off. So we just put that out in our uh, newsletter. I think the krill oil is half off for the next two days. Uh, we had a newsletter go out today. We actually do a minimum of three a week every week. And we've done that for the better part of 13 years. So if you guys want to get on the newsletter, hit me up. I'm happy to add you. Uh, but if you want any of these products, uh, jeremyscottfitness.jlabpro.com. And we do have a free supplement guide as well. Uh, we can get that to you. Uh, it's also in the extras tab inside the app. So for all of you app people, 
that extras tab is just packed full of nutritional information and guides and resources for you. More than you probably ever need, uh, but they're in there. And then obviously our friends at Dry Farms Wine, dryfarmwines.com slash Jimmy Scott Fitness. Buy a bottle of wine, get a bottle for a penny. Pure natural wine, if you guys are wine drinkers. And then our friends at Sleep Sold Separately, where I get my joggers, hoodies, t-shirts, and all the best fits that last forever. SleepSoldSeparately.com slash collection slash J Scott. Otherwise, just put the code J Scott 15 for 15% off there. And all our other sponsors are in the show and notes today. <clears throat> Man. I'm, uh, I did a Metcon here a while ago, and I'm smoked, so I'm going to do my best here. This will be a quick episode anyway, but I am on the struggle bus today. Uh, it's also Mother's Day. Shout out to all the moms out there who uh, pushed kids through their bodies, which seems really traumatic uh, when I think about it. And a uh, shout out to the moms who put up with all the bullshit uh, from kids like myself uh, over the years. And uh, if you're lucky enough to have a mom... You know, or dad, obviously, that's alive. You know, send him a note, shoot him a message, give him a call if you can. Go see him in person if possible. I'm going to swing by my mom's place here in a little bit because they moved from Detroit to here um, during the pandemic. So now they live not too far from uh, from the gym, which is kind of cool. Um, so, yeah, if you can do that, do that. It, it matters. You know, even if your parents weren't perfect, uh, they made sure you didn't die. And so you're still here uh, because of them. They gave the the bare necessities uh, and, and probably a whole hell of a lot more. And I think, you know, most parents, you know, did the best they could with what they had. And I'm generalizing, obviously, but I do think most parents, you know, they do try. They really do. They're, but again, they're just, they're kids. They're just like you, man. They were, um, you know, especially like if you're about my age, you probably have parents who were kids having kids. And uh, they did the best they could with, with what they knew. And uh, they have their own security, insecurities and faults and fears, just like you do. And they probably just masked it better. And uh, I, I share that because it's like the, the time frames, we get them messed up, right? Like when you're young, you think your parents are like super mature and old and responsible. And I'm not saying yours weren't. And I'm not saying mine were, you know, completely reckless. But it's like, I always share the story. Like I was, remember walking home with my dad. Um, my dad drove a truck over the road for 33 plus years you know, rather rough uh, individual. And uh, he's walking home, he's got his, you know, Levi's jeans on and he's rocking his red wing steel toe work boots, you know, laced all the way up. And I'm 10 at the time and I'm starting to become, you know, the athletic version of me at 10. You know, I start to realize I'm not like every kid where I'm, I'm a little bit stronger, you know, I'm a little bit faster, I can jump a little bit higher. And you're starting to see the separation between, you know, the average kids and like the athletic kids. And I remember just talking shit to my dad, like, Hey man, I'll race you home. And we're probably like a block away uh, from our house. And he's got his cooler with him. He's got the jeans on the boots all laced up. And he's like, sure. And I remember I'm just like, I'm on my horse, dude, as fast as I can go. And at 10, I'm like fast already. And my dad just fucking dusts me, like smokes me. And it ain't even close. And I'm sitting there like, how the hell is this old ass dude smoking me down the street with work boots on and jeans? And I thought to myself, as I got older in life, oh, he's probably like 33 years old. He's not old at all. But when I'm 10, I'm thinking he's like 55 and he is not. And so I share that story just because I think, you know, when you're five or six or seven, your parents, if you're around my age, they were probably like in their 20s. They didn't know what the hell they're doing. They were doing the best they could with, with what they knew. And so... I always have empathy and, and I give, you know, my parents grace for anything because it's just like I couldn't imagine having a kid when I was 22, 23, 24 years old. Like what a train wreck that would have been. So props to my mom. Props to my dad. Happy Mother's Day, Janet. See you in a little while. So we're talking about why most uh, businesses fail online, why most fitness coaches fail online, why most uh, entrepreneurs fail online. I'll make this specific to kind of like the, the health and fitness space. Cause obviously that's what I know, uh, the closest. And, uh, I'm going to forewarn you guys. This is probably not a, a podcast that most people would present in, in the way that I'm going to present it. And again, I'm playing off of a, a message from Pat Rigsby. Again, I've worked with Pat for a long time online. He was, uh, part of the first mastermind group that I did, which was 
solely focus on running an online um, kind of business and building yourself up online. And I remember reaching out about it and saying, hey, I'll join it, but I need to make at least six figures online if I'm going to try. Like if I'm going to do this and it's going to make, you know, financial sense for my life and my time, I need to make six figures. I remember having the conversation with him and I remember writing that in an email to him specifically saying, hey, here's what I need to do. And I remember him just replying back after me saying I need to do at least at least six figures. He replies back probably within two minutes and just says done. Um, if you're short, you know, we'll partner on something together and we'll get you there, which I thought was a pretty cool, cool uh, guarantee from uh, from like a business coach. You know what I mean? And uh, this episode is going to be the opposite of what you're going to hear from probably most business coaches. And it's why it's I share his unique perspective because the common approach with anybody who sells services or products in anything, especially in terms of like helping you build a business or online sales, they'll say anybody can do it. They'll tell you, if I did it, you can do it. And anybody can do it in order to kind of maximize sales. And obviously, I don't fault them for that. It's selling. It's what they do. But the reality is most people who start online businesses, who start online training businesses, they fail. And they fail real fast and they fail hard. And that's the fitness industry in general. You know, the average coach, I think we shared on here before, makes it about 18 months. Most of it, are they're not in it for the long haul. And even the ones who do just train, it's really hard to just train people, dude, for 20, 30, 40 years. Um, I'm sure there's people who've done it, but man, that seems like a hard life, like waking up and just training people over and over and over and not building any structure and systems around it. It's tough to make it. And as tough as that is, I think that's easier than people trying to crush solely online. And why is that? Like, why do most people fail online? Well, because to succeed, you have to treat it like a business. And that's what most people don't do. I think that's what a lot of people don't do with their, you know, physical businesses either. They get into it for the wrong reasons. Well, I like fitness, so I should coach fitness. That's terrible. It's saying like, I like coffee, so I should own a coffee shop. It's, they're two different things. Because you like to work out and you like to exercise and you like the gym setting, doesn't mean you should actually work in it and run your own business. Now, you might work in a gym, you might work in an online business with somebody, but to do it completely yourself, it's no longer something you do just for fun. It's a business. And with an offline business, like a brick and mortar facility, like we have here, I'm sitting inside a building that says my name on the outside, says Jeremy Scott Fitness. That is an offline business. It's a brick and mortar facility. We pay property taxes to be here. Um, we have insurance to be here. Uh, when we were down the street, before we bought this place, we had a lease for that place. We invested in equipment. Um, in this place, there's probably no less than $100,000 worth of just equipment alone. And what I think is some of the nicest stuff. We have access to every tool, but I had to invest $100,000 of obviously whether you want to call it the business's money or my own money, it's all the same to me at the end of the day. That's $100,000 I couldn't put into my primary residence. That's $100,000 I couldn't put into uh, a rental property or a car or a boat or whatever things people tend to buy with their money. I have real skin in the game. We have a posted schedule. Here's the hours we're open. Here's the hours you can meet with me. And a host of other things that are indicative of like a real commitment. Because once you sign a lease, once you buy something, you're committed now, for better or for worse. If you were to, obviously like this place, if I bought it, <clears throat> now I own it. It's mine. I'm kind, of, I'm kind of committed to being here. Back in the day when we signed a lease, we signed a, a three-year at the first time and a five-year the second time. If you sign a three-year lease or a five-year lease and you buy a bunch of equipment, you're in it. For better or for worse, you're in the game. You're going to have to figure it out. You're going to have to find a way to pay bills or they're going to come take your personal stuff. Because a lot of times when you guys are young in the game, you're given personal guarantees on property and things. In an online business, you don't have the same barrier to entry. 
In fact, the, the cost now is very minimal compared to what it used to be. If you have a MacBook and an iPhone, and you probably even need a MacBook, but if you have a MacBook and an iPhone and, uh, I don't know, a, a couple of tripods and, a, and some road mics, you can start an online business you can start an online fitness business relatively quick. Cost you what? Maybe three grand up front versus people who are signing a three year lease. You know, even if you're in a place where it's cheap, you're, let's say what's cheap rent, three grand a month, four or five grand a month. Um, so you're at $100,000, $150,000 a year. So you're in it for damn near half a million bucks, you know, between probably 200K and 450K just on the lease alone. That's not even counting equipment or anything else. But online, three thousand bucks, four thousand bucks gets you off the ground and you're running. And you can do some organic posts free on the social media platforms. Uh, if your email list is small, you can use a free uh, email service. You collect payments through PayPal and Venmo, and you can pretty much do everything with no skin in the game. You're not that much more invested in it than having it just be a, a basic hobby. And I use the word hobby because running a business like a hobby is a sure fire way to go broke. It just doesn't work that way. And honestly, most people who run a physical business that way and they treat it like a hobby, that's why they don't make it. That's why it, it crumbles because it, it it has to be a job at some point. I'm not saying you have to hate it, like dread it, like going to some you know, office job that's not for you. It can be fun. It can be play. It can be exciting. But it has to be a business. And if you don't treat it that way on some level and operate it that way at some level, it will not make it. In fact, for most people, it is very hard to make it. If you love it and you treat it like a real business, just because things are so competitive and the longevity game is very hard to attain. Over time, the longer you're in it, the more likely you are to just fail or get burnt out or have, you know, things change and, and you don't want to evolve with them or move with them or whatever it may be. So you have to treat it like it's a job. And I know in the fitness space, it's hard for people because while well, I love exercise, I love learning about it, you might, but you might like it because you enjoy it for you. And the example I give is a lot of young coaches in fitness, especially, they they do it from their vantage point first and then give it back to the people. What you really need to do is you're learning everything. You, I'm not saying you can't learn personal stuff, but a lot of young people, well, I, I like this. I think this is cool. This is important. That's awesome. What do your clients think is cool? What do your clients think is important? What do your clients really need? What do they really want? That's what matters most. And so if you're doing it because just you love it and it's your passion for it, that might not map with the people you serve, knowing your ideal client, knowing your ideal audience and knowing not only what they want, but also what they need and finding the balance there to give them both those things in a way that's fun to keep them coming back. That's what, especially in fitness, right? Like what we do is part entertainment in some way. Now, if you work and, and you're doing just like our buddy Tyler Owens down at University of Arizona, who was at Alabama forever. He's the head strength and conditioning coach. What Tyler does, and I haven't seen all of his programming. He's been on here before. We've talked about it. I actually need to go down and, and take a visit of the facilities. But what he does is people, they're on, the, they're on the football team. They have to come there and lift. They don't have a choice. They have to show up to the workouts. A lot of them want to, for sure, to get better. But they have to no matter what. Like, he's he's the coach. And so what he does is pretty straightforward. Pull, push, press, basic stuff. He doesn't have to really game it, and he doesn't have to make it fun. What we do in my world is we give people what they need, but we also sprinkle in what they want. And there's a balance there. And I don't know where to draw it for most of you coaches out there, but we've figured it out here for our people and who we serve. You know, there's entertainment value involved in it. it. I don't want to say it's like WWE, but it kind of is like you have to make it fun enough. So people want to come back. You have to design your programs in a way that they're just not doing them to do them. It's fun for them. It's a carrot they can chase. It's a video game. They can almost beat it. Some of them can, but most of them probably can't. And you're making them better along the way. And they're getting lost in the activity of fitness. They're not just focused on just the hard numbers. Some people like to grind. Sure. 
but a lot of people, it has to be fun for what we do. And there, that is where a lot of people kind of lose sight of it. Well, this is the way that I train and that might work, but it might not work because your clients might not be like you and have the same mentality as you. And if I'm talking about what we do here and what we've done, my wife and I have run online businesses as part of what we do here since like 2012, been in the game for a minute, um, over a decade selling programs and products well before the world of Instagram and TikTok and all that bullshit. Um, we had stuff on, you know, like ClickBank way back in the day, um, when things were, were definitely different. And the success that's come with that, you know, it, it wasn't a straight line. Um, it's come a long way from, from the first program I ever, you know, created online, the first product online till today. It, it's a night and day difference. Um, I do think the first thing we ever made um, was this like, it was, was it called 10 day jumpstart? It was like a 10 day something. I do think those videos are good. I haven't watched them in a long, long time, probably a good seven or eight years. So maybe they completely suck and I'm full of shit. But I put a lot of time into it. You know, they're full follow alongs. We were mic'd up. I poured my my heart into it. I, I, I tried to make it the best possible thing we could. It probably costs, and I partner with uh, Kim Mays on the nutrition aspect of it. That's our cookbook that still goes to this day. That thing I think is awesome. And uh, it costs us like $10,000 up front. And it cost me so many man hours. So many hours of you know, creating, filming, editing. And I think that product, the first one that we made, um, launched at about 500 bucks. That's what it made. So spent 10 grand, spent more hours than I'd like to admit. And I think after launch, like the first week, it made 500 total dollars. So that, my friends, is an epic fail. That's 95 bucks in the hole. And that's not even counting the hours I put into it. You know, but if I look back on it, I don't ever get to be here without doing that first one. And sometimes it's just a cost of doing business. And now obviously the barrier for entry is so much lower. You could have done that same thing today for probably a thousand dollars or fifteen hundred dollars, but because the cost of everything has come down and the barrier for entry is much easier because the phones now some of them are just as good as some of the camera shit we used back then. In fact, most of the phones are actually better. And even though that lost money and was discouraging as hell, because you're selling 500 bucks, right? And part of that 500 bucks is probably like your mom bought it just because she felt bad for you. You know, it definitely was my case. I'm sure my mom was like one of the first people who bought it. I was like, oh, I'll try this because she didn't live close to us. Probably wanted to do it, but probably wanted to just be nice. Like, so you're really not even making 500 bucks. Like, so everybody who listens to this podcast or watch what I do and sees all these things like, Oh, Jeremy, you crushed it. I'm like, well, maybe, but I shit the bed a lot too along the way, but you can't get discouraged by that because there's learning in, in that. And I didn't quit making products at that point. I didn't quit coaching online at that point. I didn't quit, you know, designing programs and challenges and different events for people to be successful in online. I just learned from it. I got good video experience. You know, I learned about production. I learned a a hell of a lot about marketing, how to present things, how important conversions and leads are and what an audience is. And uh, it wasn't 100% fail. In terms of making money, sure. But everything else, it, it was probably one of the best learning experiences. And now, you know, the successes, they can be traced back in many ways to the simple fact that I always treat it like it was a real business and I always treat it like it was a real job. In fact, in my mind, we always broke the two up. We always would say, you know, the in-person business, which is what we do in-house here. And then the online business, which is what we do offline. All the money might go to the same place at the end of the day, but they are two separate businesses. In fact, like you can even, if you want to separate the accounts and you want to separate LLCs, which we've done with partnerships, like, you know, Dave and I, you know, have had LLCs, Ben and I have had LLCs, um, Heather and I have multiple, like we've done multiple JV partnerships with other people. And if I break them up that way, 
I treated each one like it was his own individual thing. That was always mentally easier for me. So it didn't get lumped in. Well, hey, you know, because if your gym does great, but you suck online, sometimes you give more attention to one than the other, which is fine and it's normal. But if you don't think of them as two separate entities, you'll look at it as like, well, I'm still successful. Well, you might be, but the one might be just dragging the other one along. What you want them to do is both be successful, independent of each other. At least that's the way that I looked at it. And you have to know your personality type. You have to know who you are if you're going to be only online. Um, Because it's a lonely place, for sure. And it's not easy to do. Uh, I'm lucky enough to have some of the best people who are close friends of mine and, and killers and savages crush it online. And we can share best practices with each other. And we all kind of came up, you know, together in a sense. And not, not a lot of my friends own gyms anymore, uh, especially the ones who have kind of figured out the internet. It's just, it works better for them and their lifestyle and what they want to do. Like I just was in Palm Springs speaking uh, at an event and I had, I call it lunch, but like a five hour um, lunch, coffee, you know, catch up session with BJ Gador. He's 100% online. He has nothing nothing in person. He makes a hundred percent of his money offline. He's a ghost. He doesn't exist unless you have his personal cell phone and you want to connect with him. And that's really tough for people to do, but you know what he does? Treats it like a business. Doesn't treat it like a hobby. Like he clocks in and he clocks out and he has a process and he's figured it out. Hannah Eden, same thing. Lexia Clark, same thing. Like a lot of my friends in the space have just went all in on this, but all of them share the same trait. They're all self-starters. They all have an entrepreneurial mindset and they all treat it like a real job and not just a passion project. Like what time do you go to work? Even though they might do it from their home or their backyard or they might rent a space or they might own a space to just film stuff in, they treat it like a job. Like you clock in, you clock out. If you're still a person who trains in person, like I do, like we have a facility here, we have a team here, I coach some of it, our team coaches some of it. Once that's done, there's hours in the day where it's like, this is my online business time. And it's hard because it's a full-time job. You can do, you can have it as a passion project. Sure, you can have it as a side hustle or a hobby. That's great. And if that's what you treat it like, for sure, you'll probably get the results that that amount of work, you know, will dictate. But if you want it to be a real thing, you got to treat it like it's a real job. And so you clock in, you clock out. There's days that you work more on it or less on it, but you're always basically working on it. And when people say, you know, I can't work from home or, or other reasons that they struggle with consistency and focus when it comes to working online, it's tough. I get it. But if it's a business, you find a way. You find a solution. And if you're saying things like, you know, I can't work from home because I struggle with focus and consistency, then this is not for you. Um, this is something where you're going to work a shit ton of hours for yourself so you don't have to work as many hours for somebody else. But to think that it's just something you can do for a couple hours a week in a competitive space that we're living in, it's just not a thing. And yeah, the reason most online training businesses don't succeed is that they aren't run like businesses and they need to be run that way in order to achieve success. Like they, you have to treat it like it's a real thing. You have to do the work every day, 365, you know, for me, <clears throat> excuse me. And you don't have to have my process, but you have to have a real process. And, and maybe that's, if you're going to do this and be on the internet, it's a Monday through Friday, it's a nine to five. And it's all work and no play during those hours. And maybe you have the weekends off, but you do have to work. You really do. To think that you're going to do this and just get on your phone, film a couple of videos, make a couple of posts, and uh, it's going to blow up and make you one, two, three, four, five hundred thousand dollars a year. You're living in fantasy land. Um, you have to be willing to work, and you have to be willing to go through the hard stuff and persevere and you're you have to be willing to invest time effort energy and money if you want to make it be successful you have to take the losses um, and you're going to have a lot of them and there's going to be whole seasons you know where you lose but 
you have to look at the macro versus the micro and in the big picture of what you're doing. You might make a program or a product and it might just suck and nobody buys it and nobody cares and it, and it did half as good as you thought it was going to do. That's okay. There's learning in that. I've been through it. Anybody's been through it. You have to have super thick skin. You have to be 100% self-starter. You just that, that is that, Those two things go hand in hand. You have to be one to motivate yourself each and every day and you have to have thick skin. Because now you're in this all by yourself. And again, I mentioned it briefly earlier. It's a really lonely place to be for a lot of people. Because it's just you. You might have a team. You might have people helping you. But at the end of the day, it, you're the one who's responsible for all of this. And you have to be okay with that as you're going through it. I'll say this. You know, with the seasons um, that you'll go through, there'll be wins, there'll be losses, there's ups, there's downs. When it's just you on the internet, you have to look at it long tail. You can't get bogged down by the little losses you take every single day. Like if you're what we do, if it's a product launch and you're trying to do, you know, I'm going to push 300 units of something. If you only sell 142, that's okay. You can learn from that. If you lose two clients in a day, maybe your clients are worth 500 bucks a month or a thousand bucks a month. That hurts. And that's probably going to stick with you. But you can't let it rob you of the whole day and you can't let it, you know, steal productivity from you. You just have to put your head down and keep moving forward. And there's been, you know, seasons that that I didn't love. And the one thing I always come back to is just telling myself everything is temporary. You know, I think that's in life, right? Like if you're you're sick, it's temporary. You're injured, it's temporary. You know, you got laid off from your job or fired or maybe you didn't hit your sales goals. It's temporary. If you're having, you know, 20 great days in a row, you're going to have some shitty days. If you're having, you know, 20 shitty days in a row, you got some good days coming up. You really do. And we went through seasons here. We went through, you know, a COVID season, you know, of life. And uh, a lot of the things I did that made money stopped making money. We didn't have any major fitness events. I wasn't getting hired by these corporations to come and just do fitness while they pay me an obscene amount of money to do it. I had no speaking engagements. So the last speak, speak, speech, speech, the last talk I did, I'm losing my mind here. Let's see. I'm getting tired. Uh, the last talk I did before some of these recent ones was in February of 2020 when I did a talk to McCarthy Construction at the W in Scottsdale to their leadership team. That was the last time I got paid to speak and do a fitness event in person until last year. So think about that. That's a long season, dude. And and I don't think that ever happens again, knock on wood. But if that's a part of my business, if that's a revenue stream, I'm not speaking. I'm not doing fitness events. And maybe that's worth to me 20 grand a year, 30 grand a year, 40 grand a year, 50 grand a year, gone, 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 gone. Like that sucks, dude, but that's a season. And so what you have to do is when things might not be going your way, you got to be willing to pivot and move and do something different and be creative because it's all on you and it's the internet and there is no rules. That's the beauty of it. So you're going to take losses for sure, but you got to be willing to kind of fight through those and pivot and look at other opportunities and have a real entrepreneur mindset and treat it like a job if you're going to be successful. Again, some days you'll, you know, you'll lose five clients, but then the next week you might gain six. And some days and weeks you just lose. But you have to be disciplined and committed in some ways more so in an online business than an in-person business. Because in many online models, you don't have a group of people expecting you to show up and coach them at six in the morning. You've got to do the work when nobody is waiting and nobody is watching and nobody knows you wouldn't have done it. And that's, you know, why I feel most never make it because you have to do things when nobody expects you to do it and you have to just keep showing up and, and putting in the work day after day after day after day. You also have to be good with the basic like P&L sheet. Like what's the profit 
and loss statement. How much money are you spending? How much money are you making? You also have to market it pretty much 24 seven, 365, whether you do that in real time or you set the stuff up, you have to market your shit all the time. McDonald's does it every day. Coca-Cola does it every day. And these are brands that everybody in the world knows. And they are relentless with their commercials and their advertisements and the placement. And to think that you're going to be successful in this sea of, you know, millions of people trying to grab market share and you're not marketing your stuff 24-7, 365. And then you're wondering why you're not making more money or why your business isn't doing better. It's that simple. If you have these free platforms, they are free. And you're not at least doing the free stuff and posting on them consistently engaging, interacting with the people that you want to work with. And you're wondering why you don't have, you know, 20 more clients or, you know, 15 more members, or you're not making 10,000 more dollars. It's probably as simple as that. You're not doing the legwork behind the scenes. And if you're capped out with clients and you filled everything, that doesn't mean you stop marketing. You keep marketing because like we mentioned, five people could leave in a day. Two people could leave in a day. And how much are those two people worth? So if you have two clients paying you $5,000 a month and you only make $10,000 a month and those two clients leave, that's half your business. It's gone. So you can't afford to not be consistently looking ahead and always be just flooding the market with everything you do and making connections and looking for the next step. That's the thing that I would say is most exhausting other than anything else. I love most of the things here. We don't sell anything. All we do is talk, present, share, and try to create value when we can. But that is marketing, you know, no matter how you look at it. And that's the thing that's the most exhausting because it's relentless. It's 24-7, 365. And if I say anything to you guys, if you remember anything from this whole episode, if you want to be on the internet, it's relationships. Yeah, you're going to create the best product in the world that you possibly can for your ability and give it to people to help them to solve their problem. And, uh, it's really how you make money. You solve problems. Like that's how people make money. You solve people's problems. And if you want to solve, you know, rich people's problems, you, you probably get paid more because they have more money, you know? And if you sell higher ticket stuff, it, it's just as simple. But you still have to create the relationship. Make the best thing you can, but build a relationship with somebody. And it's much harder online than it is in person. It just is because there's no physical contact. They see you, but through a video, you know, like you guys watching on YouTube, or they hear you through a podcast. And a lot of you guys, you know, feel like you know me, you know, really close. And you've, you've never met me. You've never seen me in person. We've never been in the same room or, or probably the same state. <clears throat> Sometimes we're not even the same country for a lot of you. And yet you feel like you know so much about my life and there's this connection there. And that's what you do. That's what the buy-in is. And you have to commit to doing that. You have to commit to putting out stuff consistently. You have to commit to reading people's comments and engaging with them and making them a part of your life. And I'm not saying everybody has to do that to be successful online, but that's what we've done here. And I, there's something I do get from it for sure. I, I like connecting with you guys. It's kind of like the oxygen that keeps this train going. I get to hear from you and, and speak to you and, we create this relationship and there's so many people's names and faces and I, I know kind of their personality and their their workout style and what music they like just by seeing the videos that they post inside of our, our groups for the app and the people who fly here. It's really humbling and it's really unique, but that's hard to do. It's very hard for people to put in that much effort consistently online to build the relationships. It's tough. And it's a huge reason people don't have long tail repeat customers and clients for, you know, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 years online. But that's what you have to do if you really want to make it because there's people like me who are willing to do that. And that's who you're competing against. And that's the beauty of the internet is that you can sell to everybody and you can work with anybody it doesn't matter if they have internet connection, you can work with them, talk to them, touch them, and they can be part of your community and your tribe and your life. And that's the great part. And the tough part is, is that you compete with everybody else and what they're offering and what they're doing. The cool thing is you don't need a million people. In person, I've said this before, I'll say it again, you probably need 100 people in person 
to really do it. A hundred raving fans in person who love your shit. And online, you probably need a thousand. You probably need a thousand people who love what you do. And again, most of you fitness coaches out there and entrepreneurs know it's probably hard for you to get a hundred clients in person. A lot of you probably have 10. And that's probably hard. And so you know how hard a hundred is. And then online, you might have 22. But to get to a thousand is a huge jump. And it's difficult. And most people will never tell you that because it'll cost them sales. You're not going to join their mastermind group. You're not going to buy their course. They don't want to tell you very few people make it. And it's way harder than doing a hundred other professions. But I'll tell you though, because if you're going to do it, I want you guys to be successful and I want you to succeed and I want you to know what it takes. And most people won't do what it takes. But if you will, success can be yours. I think if you're willing to treat it like a real job, if you really love it, if you care about it, if you go into it with a beginner's mindset, if you have, you know, maybe an awesome coach to help you get there, or you got great friends who also do it and you can beg, borrow and steal from them. That's the key. But you got to be a killer, man. And you're going to have to, if it's fitness, you're going to have to learn things that you maybe don't want to learn. You know, to be honest, like, did I ever think I would go learn all these things about YouTube and Instagram and Facebook and Infusionsoft, you know, and how to create a podcast and all the technology that goes around it and all the apps and the platforms and StreamYard and all these things. I didn't. But if I didn't do that, none of you would see anything I've ever done and none of you would be listening to me today. So you have to be willing to do things outside of your skill set and comfort zone. And that's what separates you from everybody else. And so again, I want you guys to be successful and do what it takes to get there because most people won't. And if you can just stay alive and just stay in the game and keep working and listening and learning and refining it, it is possible for you to break through. But most people, they won't. They're better off working for somebody else Um having clients in person or whatever it is, or having a mix. And that's okay too. Um, This is not a a talk to discourage anybody or say one's better than the other because it's not. But if you want to do it, you have to really treat it serious and and put in more work than you probably ever imagined possible. And even then, there's a higher probability that you'll fail without some real guidance and some real benchmarks and uh, some accountability behind you. And I I say all that because like I've been toying with doing a like a mastermind business group, um, maybe early 2024. We've done a lot of consulting in this area with with coaches. Uh, a lot of the huddle calls I have with people when they call into us, it's actually other fitness professionals, and we talk a lot about their business and what they're doing and what they want to do. And I've had people actually fly in here and do like half day consulting with me to build their business as well, which I think is the best. And so. I've been talking with uh, Dave DiLorenzo, and you guys have seen him on my Instagram. He's the crazy hair guy who's a lunatic. He uh, he runs a very successful uh, insurance business, you know. And this is this would be a group that I would I would probably partner with him if we put it together, because uh, he's built a business that's made millions and millions and millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars, and he's been uh, insanely successful doing it. And I think that's a great. It'd be great for you guys. Um, who are really serious about it because you'll get, you know, the selling, the marketing, you'll get how to build a small to kind of medium sized business that fits your ideal lifestyle. And I, and I, I asked Dave about this because he, he's created a lifestyle that he really loves. And I think that's important. There's a lot of people that I could connect with that have just built businesses, but he has a lifestyle. Like I love my lifestyle. He loves his and you've been able to, to merge it with what you're passionate about and make money doing it. So I'm throwing it out there. Anybody who's interested, just shoot me a message if they're like, you know what, Jeremy, that sounds like something I'd want to do. Obviously, it's not free, um, but it will help you build a business that you want to actually have and it'll help you be successful in it. If you're putting in the work, we'll give you every single tool to do it and be brutally honest with you about you know, how to get there and what's realistic and, and what's not realistic. So uh, I just thought I'd mention that real quick because that is something that 
might be happening in early 2024. Like I need more things to do, but I do have a passion for it. Obviously, I do podcasts on it. And uh, I want to see good people be successful, whether it's in this space or a different space. It doesn't matter if it's a service business. All the principles are exactly the same. Um, I just happen to do this one. Um, but we'll talk all things inside there. It's basically just an online entrepreneurship group for people who who are really serious and, and want to invest some money and invest some time into taking their business to a level that has never been before. Uh, real quick, I'll do Q&A here. Um, I just got a couple and I got to get out of here. Uh, number one, this was, how would you structure your training and nutrition when, I take this from Instagram, by the way. Um, we asked Instagram and so I'll answer just a couple real quick. How would you structure your training and nutrition when working a nine to five job? Uh, honestly, I think it's easier um, doing it that way than what I do personally. Uh, that's not a knock against anybody. It's just my schedule can be, I, I obviously I'm in charge of my schedule, but it does get erratic sometimes. Uh, I'm in the, the service business and I'm doing a lot of things with a lot of people and uh, it gets tough, uh, especially because everything's my responsibility. So when like something goes wrong, uh, I got to put out the fires and deal with the bullshit. Like the other day, we mistakenly, we didn't, but our system did automatically build a guy like 12 times in a row. So I wake up to like 12, 12 charges that shouldn't have happened uh, to one single individual. And uh, that's not fun. And uh, I'm trying to figure that out. I have a speech to give in Palm Springs at like nine in the morning. And I'm reading this at like, you know, four o'clock in the morning in the pitch dark, trying to talk with Matt Sizemore about it. Like, hey, Matt, how can we fix this? Blah, blah, blah. Things like that happen in my day all the fucking time, and it's super annoying, but that's part of the game. So I have to be more fluid sometimes because some of those things are going to take precedence and they need to be figured out because I don't want to drain some guy's bank account, you know, that I shouldn't be draining. And so if it was me in a nine to five, I personally, at this point in my life, and I, I was, I had to go to work at nine, whether it was from home or an actual place I had to go. I would probably work out early in the morning just because after five, it's too easy to make excuses. And I think I'd be smoked mentally from doing whatever job I was doing. So I would train earlier, even though I used to be a person who would rather train at like 6 p.m. than 6 a.m. I think if you can train from six, you know, if you can do mobility and work out six to seven in the morning, I think that's probably the best time. And then go home, shower, grab your stuff and go to work. So that way it's done. No matter what happens in your day, you can't make an excuse and you've already booked it. That's the people here that we see uh, tend to be the most successful. Even though we have people who crush it at night too, that's just what I would do. And then eating wise, you know, if I was going to eat a meal at work, I would bring it with me every day. I wouldn't do the team lunches and, and I wouldn't do that bullshit. It's just not who I am and I would could care less what people think. And I would eat, you know, if it was, if I had to eat at work, I would eat at, you know, one o'clock or two o'clock and then I'd eat my dinner at six or whatever. And I would just call it a day if that's what I did. Um, if, otherwise I maybe I'd fast all day and just eat later. But if I was going to train that early, I'd probably have to eat a little earlier too. So maybe I'd eat at noon and then obviously from there, but I would, I would pack and, and prep and plan everything humanly possible. And that's how I would structure it. Cause I think that would be the best for me and my personality type. Uh, do you have any siblings? Feels like you never mentioned them. Yes, I do have a sister. She is close to my age. She lives in Florida and she is the exact opposite of me in every human way possible. Other than she loves uh, 90s hip hop music and that's probably about it. Other than that, we are the exact opposites in every humanly way possible. Next one. How do you do um, proportions affecting lifting form. I have a short torso and any tips would be great. Honestly, you know, every lift isn't for everybody. Uh, I've, I've always said this and I believe this. Every lift isn't for you. You don't have to do any lifts. In fact, like there's not one exercise you have to do. You can squat 30 different ways and get great results. You don't ever have to back squat. You don't ever have to use a barbell for that matter. And you can be ripped, shredded, strong, and move amazing. That's 100% true. Um, it's my belief, and I, I, that's a fact. I don't think it's just a belief. I, I, I've not seen any proof, any meta-analysis, any peer-reviewed studies that say you have to barbell deadlift to be strong and fit and healthy. It's just not true. You don't have to barbell deadlift ever. Um, there's a million ways you can, you can get to the end result. So 
I'm always a fan of, you know, doing movements that feel good for your body, that you're confident in, that you can move through pain-free range of motion in. And if something doesn't feel good, don't do it. Like if you don't feel good uh, barbell bench pressing, don't do it. If you don't feel good split squatting, and not like you hate it because split squats suck, but it just just feels off to you. Maybe you're not as stable. Maybe try reverse lunges. Maybe try an assisted split squat. Maybe try split squatting from the floor. Like there's a million other variations of single leg work you can do. So I always say, you know, work on your weaknesses, but just play to your strengths, man, and, and do the movements that you feel a good mind muscle connection with and know that every exercise is not going to be for you, whether it be, you know, your mechanics, uh, body type, uh, you know, genetics, if you will, I guess, which would fall into there, uh, pre-existing injury. You can always do an alternative and substitution. Even oftentimes, like when we create programs, if someone's like, yeah, Jeremy, this is the way you said do push-ups, but I did these push-ups instead. That's awesome. Like, I, I don't think of it in terms of just exercise. Like a push is a push is a push. A pull is a pull is a pull. If it's hip dominant, it's hip dominant, it's hip dominant. There's eight other things you can do to get the same result. There are certain things that I used to do that I don't do anymore because even if I was like, I used to do a lot of heavy barbell bent rows, underhand grip. Um, I'm very strong there for some reason, naturally. I'm, I'm, I don't have, like, I'm not, I'm not nearly as strong with the overhand grip as the underhand grip, which is natural. And I think that's what most people fall into, but I, maybe that's because I can do, I'm I'm really good at pull-ups and and that kind of stuff. I don't know, but I used to do really heavy underhand barbell bent rows and I was good at them, but they never felt good to me. Does that make sense what I'm saying? So even though I was, I could put a lot of weight on compared to my savage training partners who are also strong, I was just stronger there but I never felt good doing it. And so now I don't do those because I don't need to. It doesn't make any sense to me. Like, why am I going to suffer if I don't have to suffer? If I want to go a chest supported row and load that shit up heavy, why not? It's a much safer position and I feel a much better squeeze and contraction there. I also like a gorilla row better. I like a single arm row better. There's just, there's five other things to do. So my point is that, you know, work with your body, work with what feels good to you. And I think you'll be okay. Next one. When you do, when do you think it's the correct time for kids to start lifting weights? It depends on the kid, you know, um, their maturation age, how big they are. There's kids who come in here or 14 who are, you know, a hundred pounds and five foot two. And there's kids who come here at 14. They're big as me. You know, there's a difference. Uh, what I would say is, I don't know, 14, 15, 16, maybe Uh, I started super young. Like my mom, again, had like a, and my dad had like, gave me these, these plastic weights, the ones you would fill with like water and sand. And we had those like in our little apartment. And, uh, I remember doing those bench pressing with those, doing curls with those squatting with those things. But I had no business doing that because I hadn't mastered body weight yet. And I was probably doing that when I was like six, seven, eight, nine, I was doing push ups and sit ups and shit when I was like probably in second grade, first grade, who knows? I just always thought fitness was cool. I always thought, you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger was the shit. Like I wanted to be jacked, you know, that's just, just being completely truthful, but I shouldn't have been loading yet. I think the age to do it is when they can master their body weight. So when your kid can squat perfectly and safely with their body weight, when they can do a push up, then you can start adding like light loads to them. But I think a lot of times, like, can they do a pull up? You know, can they hang from a, a pull up bar for more than a minute? Or can they make it 30 seconds? I think these are all great measures. Can they do body weight walking lunges? And you can have them do things like sled pulls and sled pushes and, you know, box step ups and body weight split squats. Uh, those are all great places to start before you even load. And once you can do those with some some competency and you've owned that skill and you can be relatively, you know, flexible and strong in those positions, I think loading is fine. But for most kids, that's probably if they're, you know, training consistently, uh, 14, 15, 16, somewhere in there. Next one. Um, should you promote or try and grow organically word of mouth? Yeah, this is the whole podcast. Yeah. You got to promote your own shit. You got to be your own biggest fan. 
You got to toot your own horn loud as fuck. I'm not saying you got to call your business Jeremy Scott Fitness because it makes you look like an asshole um, and egotistical. And it's not why I started this and it's not why I did it. But my God, if it hasn't worked out for me. And uh, I remember talking about my stuff way back in the day before anybody gave a shit. And I'm sure people thought I was, they've told me this, they thought I was a complete idiot. You know, I'm, I call my business my name and I, I talk about my shit all day long. But I had to. Like, if I'm not, you know, my own biggest fan, who's going to be? If I don't promote my own stuff and market it and throw it out there all the time in front of your face, who else is going to do it for me? The answer is nobody. And it doesn't matter how good you are if nobody knows about you. You know what I mean? Like, because then just the loud people who suck get all the money and all the attention and, and all of the, you know, traffic and all the clients. And you don't want that. If you If you're good... And you want to help people, you got to let them know about it. And you got to present it in a way that shows them that. And so you have to be on it all the time. So yeah, organically and word of mouth is great. And you can pay for ads and you can do all that stuff. But if you're not maximizing all these platforms and all of your people already, then I wouldn't spend money on ads yet. You're just not there. I would say your business is going to run on referrals. Whether that's referrals in person or referrals online, like that's how it works. You know, there can be things like Google reviews and Yelp reviews and podcast reviews and if you guys want to drop us those, we'll always take them and we appreciate them. But word of mouth is what it's going to be. People sharing your stuff because you've created a raving fan and you've created a satisfied customer. That's what grows your business. Next one. Have you ever heard of the knees over toes guy? What are your thoughts? Yeah, for sure. Um, I've been through the zero programs that they do. They're cool. Um, for me, very basic stuff. Yeah. Uh, all makes logical sense. A lot of it reminds me of like Charles Poliquin stuff. Uh, if you look at like his books and a lot of the teachings, a lot of the similarities in a lot of things, uh, not overly complex, not complicated. Uh, for some people, I think even the zero programs are tough. Definitely. You have to regress. I think you got to take your time with it. But if you're at a place where you want to build your body back up and you're willing to take, you know, a bunch of steps back, I think it's great. I'm always a fan of of doing mobility. I'm always a fan of owning certain patterns. Uh, I think it's awesome. I'm just a fan of fitness. I'm a fan of movement. I'm a fan of pe people being pain free. So yeah, um, I think it's good. It's a time commitment for sure. You know, I'm a huge fan of uh, mobility wad or I always say that it used to be ready state with Kelly Sturette. And uh, you can take like a fitness assessment in there, right in that app. And it'll give you a prescription of what to do. Hey, for your shoulders or your hips or your back. The problem I have with it is most people aren't, aren't committed to doing it. Most people just aren't committed to doing the daily work, you know, and, I, and I've shared this on here before. I'm going to do a whole podcast on coming back from injury, but for the last 10 weeks, I've done an hour of mobility every single day, a minimum of an hour, I should say. Some days it's two hours. Some days it was three hours of working through tissue and doing mobility drills to fix the things that I need to fix in my body for the way that I move and what I want to do. Because training hard as hell, the harder you train and the more you do it, the more tissue work and mobility you have to do. It's just that that's how it works. You know, so more work begets more work essentially. And you don't have to do that forever. Obviously, I'm not going to do a, an hour of mobility every single day the rest of my life. Or I don't know, maybe I will if I like it and I feel good, but I don't have to. But that's what I've done for those 10 weeks to fix the things that I want to fix and to get through ranges of motion that I want to get to and to do, if it's to do the splits, if it, you know, there's certain things I just want to do because I want to do them and I become obsessed with things. That's what you have to do when you do some of those programs. And a lot of people just aren't willing to see things through because most people, you know, they just want to do, I want to go in, I want to sweat, I want to beat myself up and who am I to judge? But for a lot of people you've had a stressful day and your life is stressful. And the last thing you need is just to go into the gym and beat the shit out of yourself for 30, 40, 50, 60 minutes, do no tissue work and no mobility, and then go to your stress, you know, filled life at home and then wash, rinse, repeat that. I think it's a recipe for most people to be, you know, overly stressed and it's a disaster and your body eventually will, you know, kind of shut down because of it. There's a balance there and there's a mix there. And so, yeah, to answer the question, yeah, I, I like some of the stuff. And I think it's great. And I think it helps people if they're willing to do it. And that's my big thing is getting people to adhere to a program for 
four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks, and beyond, um, it's a big ask. But if you're serious, these things can help for sure. And the last one, about your mom, how great they are. Yeah, that's my mom wrote that a message on Instagram. Just snuck that in there. Yeah, mom, you're great. I appreciate you, and I'm, I'm not dead because of you, and uh, I'll always thank you for that. And honestly, my mom is probably my number one fan, you know, next to, to Heather. And my mom, those are my number one and two fans. And I guess that they should be, right? Like, that's that's your that's your tribe. That's your circle. And, uh, you know, my mom, she was never perfect. No mom is. But never told me I, I couldn't do something that was good for me. You know, I asked to do a lot of dumb shit. But my mom never told me I couldn't do something that I wanted to try. Like, give it a chance. And I always had this belief in me that this would work out. And the same thing for my wife. So, uh, Mom, I do thank you for that. Because if you didn't tell me I could do this and didn't believe in me, I probably would have doubted myself too. And uh, I probably wouldn't be here. Same goes for my dad. My dad never said he thought this would work out. I'm sure he thought I was a complete idiot, but he never told me that. So that's helpful too. So even if you don't believe in your kids and their crazy ass dreams, just don't tell them that you think they suck because then they'll probably believe it and then they'll never, ever make it happen. So thank you, mom. I appreciate you. Happy Mother's Day to you and all the awesome moms out there. I'll see you in a little bit. Everybody else, um, hopefully this podcast made sense. If you're looking to get into the space, if you got a question, just know uh, I'm happy to answer it. And, and we might be putting a mastermind group together that can help some of you guys really, you know, change your life, level up your business and make real money um, in the process because I've done it. Dave's done it. And I think it's something that we can help people with. And I do get excited about that because it's a different, it's, it's something different for me. And uh, I like to share things that have worked for me. That, that can work for other people who are willing to put in the work. And that's what we do here at Jeremy's Got Fitness. And that's what we do um, with the mastermind group that's going to be coming in 2024, I think is the goal. So um, Summer Advanced Metcon, 522. Uh, links in the bio, enter, register, work out with us next five weeks. I'd love to have you guys in there. Uh, Athletic Greens, want a free sample, hit me up. All the other podcast sponsors are below. Check them out. Thank you guys on YouTube. I appreciate you as always. I'll be back next Friday. I got a bunch of travel stuff coming up, but man, I will um, I'll do my best to get you the podcast even when I'm on the road because uh, I know it matters to a lot of you guys and, and I appreciate talking to you. So have an awesome Mother's Day, everybody. And uh, if you're on Apple Podcast or Spotify, drop us a five-star, leave a comment. I would appreciate it. If you want to drop us a Google review because you love us, we'll take that as well. And uh, thank you guys. Always humbled uh, to have you listening to us. So until next time, eat well, train hard, be nice to people. And please, you guys, keep doing shit you love with people you enjoy because your life is too short not to. I'll talk to you soon. Peace.